So economics, otherwise known as modes of production. So again, uh, number one basic need, food and water. Water was not hard to find in a frozen place. Uh, all we had to do was melt it, right? So they did not have to necessarily worry about rivers, streams, and parking it next to these locations. Uh, water was there. Um, uh, heating sources tended to be oil from animal blubber, right? No wood, no vegetation. So, um, and then how would they start that oil fire? They usually used moss, okay, um, as kind of a wick. And, and uh, we can talk about that kind of more when we get into technology and material culture. Um, which, which goes along with economics and modes of production, right? The only way that we eat is if we actually have hooks to fish, okay? So, um, again, this is, these are all tied together. So, in these areas, communal uh, distribution of food was very, very important. Um, men did most of the hunting, okay? Hunting was very dangerous, and we'll talk about that later on, too. Uh, women processed the animals, distributed the meat. Uh, gathered the little bit of plants that did exist, and moss may be included in this, um, and manufactured products, made meals, made the clothing. Uh, women did the processing. And this, again, when we talk in generalities, if you took all the band and tribal level uh, people throughout the world, you see that this tends to be on the more general side. Now, did women hunt? Yes. Are there tribes where women did most of the hunting? Yes. Uh, the Ogta and the Philippines are, are an interesting group that, that do do this. Um, so can we say it's a universal? No. However, as a general rule, this did happen. And in many groups, we do have taboos around women hunting because they are the life givers, not the life takers. Um, and again, we carry these taboos even into kind of the modern age, right? We have just started to allow women to fight in combat roles. Uh, this would be coming from this taboo from very, very long ago. Um, so again, these are kind of the gender uh, breakdowns of role in terms of economics. Um, again, were they universal all the time? Did men do all the hunting all the time? No. Uh, let's say that we had a shortage of men in a band or a tribe group. Uh, the women are going to go do that for survival, right? Um, let's say that 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 there was so much work to do in terms of, of butchering animals or uh, making clothing, okay, or building housing, uh, the infrastructure of the housing. Men are gonna help with that as well, okay? Um, some of the food taboos, interesting. Uh, one was polar bear livers, which are really, really high in vitamin E and make people sick. Vitamin E is a fat soluble, soluble vitamin, which means uh, you don't just get rid of it through urination like you do B and C. Uh, a and D are dangerous at high levels. So these groups of people created food taboos. Now food taboos, uh, we have food taboos like eating dog, horse, and bugs. Our taboos are more based on economics and wealth, not on actual getting sick from the animals, okay? So many groups you'll see create taboos around things that make us ill. Um, another taboo that they had was not to mix ocean and land animals together, stored or cooked. Um, and ocean the, the, the fascinating one here is you wouldn't even mix ocean fish with uh, freshwater fish. Uh, they kept them completely separate. And you also see these taboos in many different locations. Um, and again, I think that one of the things that's interesting in America is we do things like surf and turf. Uh, where we even maybe put um, cheese or uh, dairy on a fish product. This would be breaking their taboo, right? Because it's a land animal product versus an ocean animal product. Um, uh, many groups and cultures have taboos around mixing foods. Um, and, and Americans tend to less have less taboos around that and more taboos around uh, kind of the economic status of actual food products like bugs uh, became kind of below Americans. We just don't eat those. That's not for civilized, so-called civilized people, uh, even though it's the best protein source we have on the planet um, in terms of land animals. Um, but yeah, so this is a uh, fascinating separation. Did the taboo come out of somebody getting sick sometime like the polar bear livers could have been. Um, it could also be related to ideology. So a couple things here. In terms of anthropology, when we're analyzing why people do what they do, 
right? Because that's always the question. Why do people do what they do? Um, the polar bear liver and people getting sick would be a cultural materialist taboo, uh, which is ultimately this caused people to get sick. So then we created this kind of ideological, maybe even a religious explanation for not doing these activities. Um, the other side could, and again, this gets into chicken or egg, right? Who comes first? Uh, the other side is that some of these taboos could be around your ideology. For instance, uh, mixing ocean with land animals could be part of this group's reincarnation concepts, where you're not treating the animal properly, and then in the next, next life, it's not going to be, it's not going to allow itself to be caught by you in the hunt because you did not treat it properly. So sometimes taboos form out of ideology and then turn into material reasons, right? Taboos. And then sometimes they start out of cultural material or energy or ecology reasons and turn into ideological or religion, uh, religious concepts. So kind of always be uh, wondering where these kind of things maybe came, for, came from and then, then be able to analyze both sides of that conversation. Um, uh, mammal blubber, uh, super interesting uh, use of all of the animal, right? Remember these people used every piece of the animal uh, from teeth to the whiskers to uh, every part of the, all the organs, unless there was a taboo like the polar bear livers. Um, which were probably fed to the dogs or um, cooked more sparingly. Um, and again, uh, mammal blubber was used for heating lamps, which they basically made pots of stone holders, and they would basically heat the oil and the moss would act as a wick. So then you would, you would ultimately, and even when that would harden, it would be like a candle, right, for heating and light. Um, they would use it for that. They would consume it. Um, and what's fascinating is that they tend to have lower rates of cholesterol than Westerners. Why? Well, you probably, there's, there's, there's varying degrees. Again, why do they have lower levels of cholesterol when we talk about saturated fat? One is uh, natural selection. These people basically over time have developed the ability to break down this cholesterol in this way so that it does not harm them. And anybody who couldn't do this early on would have died off and not reproduced. The people who could reproduced, and now this is the population that we're studying. Um, that is one explanation. The other is, is that there's a um, keto diet is currently higher in fats and is, is purported to, to help people kind of lower cholesterol in this way. Again, I'm not preaching any, I'm not on a keto diet, but again, just kind of giving you a modern day spin on this concept of, of fat doesn't necessarily equal cholesterol. Um, Dogs, uh, dogs were a huge portion of the economy, okay, um, and a huge part of their life. Uh, they lived with the dogs. The dogs ultimately helped with the hunt, and uh, they spotted the seal breathing holes. So they would, the dogs would point out where these holes were, and played a huge role in in this process. Um, dogs would even, in times of famine, be be sources of protein. So again, there may have been a common kind of cultural uh, acceptance of, hey, the dogs are our working buddies. Uh, however, when there was times of famine, they would, they would turn to them as a food source as well. Um, uh, this also, getting back to some of these taboos, so dogs would have been a temporary taboo, but in times of famine, it's allowable. Uh, this also goes along with people. Uh, uh, the Arctic peoples didn't go around cannibalizing each other. However, during times of famine, uh, cannibalizing the dead would have happened. Um, and again, it's an acceptable taboo. We just, I, I just, I, in week three, we kind of looked at uh, Jamestown, right? And, and the controversy that, that this cannibal, uh, in times of famine, Donner Party, um, uh, the soccer team, um, from Uruguay, those kind of groups, uh, we, we look at and, and have this weird feeling inside because we know that it's not necessarily uh, maybe even in us to eat our own. Um, and, and same with, with harming other, other humans. There may be kind of an internal uh, taboo empathy gene that is in us that says that this is wrong, but in times of famine and survival, that overrides that gene, right? Um, and dogs would have played this, this similar role. Um, uh, ultimately, part of that, that hunt, uh, the Arctic peoples would have found the hole, and then they, they ultimately wait for the seal to come up, and then they harpoon uh, the seal, they pull the seal out, and, and um, that's basically what the hunt looks like. Yumikas are boats used in the Inuit group uh, at Greenland. 
uh, for Arctic whale hunts. These are bigger whale hunts, especially, you know, get into the Norwal and even bigger than that. Um, and what's interesting here is that owners of the boats had higher status. They then divvy up the meat that they catch, and then those, then the extra meat goes out to the village. Uh, so it's a hierarchy based on ownership. Now we have private ownership of a boat. Um, and again, so this, this is going to add status, right? And, and typically, if they were also patrilineal, then they're going to pass down that status to their, their sons, okay? Um, so again, ownership. So we have two things that create status so far, right? We have patrilineal descent tends to create status in a political way if they have a headman or that kind of structure. It's not always universal there either. However, if we get into private property like owning a boat, then we're also moving into this status, right? A hierarchy of status. Now, this is the tough part with egalitarianism, okay? Going back to it, uh, women and men in egalitarian societies have different roles, but equal status for those roles. Um, owning a boat puts my status above others. So now I have more power. And literally, I have power because I'm distributing food caught from that boat. That's power of life. And so now we have a power structure and an inequality system. These are going to, to lead into some of the things that we have currently in our society. Okay? Um, the hunters must be, uh, they were respectful to all animals killed because of the belief in reincarnation. They believed if they were not um, appreciative or didn't do the right things or didn't uh, process the animal right, um, then the the animal would not come back and allow to be hunted, okay? So, so very important. Kayaks were the other big boats. So if you remember the Yumikas and the kayaks, kayaks basically are the same kind of kayaks that we use today, and we'll talk about more of that uh, when we get into the technology. Caribou, bear, musk ox, and other animals uh, used for their skins and meat. Um, birds, eggs, and fish also vital to the diet. Um, but you can see very heavy in, in the animal side of things. But animals, and if you eat all part of the animal, we get enough vitamins, okay? Uh, vitamin C may have been one of the ones that was lacking, but they probably end up getting that from, from the little plant sources that they did have, okay? Um, and again, they may have even had to trade for some of these berries and whatnot with the suboptic peoples for some of these things. Um, famine produced an uh, adaptation, right? Now here's the other piece is that we think of, of keeping food so that it doesn't spoil, right? We have a refrigerator. They had, their whole environment was a giant refrigerator slash freezer. Okay, so if you stored enough food, uh, freeze dried the meat, um, you could store meat for, for a long period of time, years and years and years, and have it ready to go. So if you had a famine, ultimately we could just pull out of that stash and, and eat. Um, however, it did get, it did get uh, sketchy sometimes where uh, dogs would have to be consumed and the dead would have to be consumed when it was really, really tough times. Even skins would start to be eaten, boiled down and eaten in these rough times. Um, even in this group, uh, we talked about infanticide uh, in the last kind of uh, lecture segment. Um, it tended to be more females, uh, which again may have coincided with a shortage of men because so many men died in the hunt. They slip through the ice, they tip a uh, kayak or, or uh, yeah, you meet go over, they go overboard, they freeze to death. Remember, we didn't have giant fires, right? They had, they had kind of heat lamps or, or fuel in that way, but, but they did not have these uh, ways of heating themselves up fast enough. So a lot of times it was, it was uh, walruses would also kill a lot of these, these individuals. Um, again, you had, you had some harsh environment, killer whales. Some, I mean, this was not a easy place to go hunting, and especially because... Uh, humans are land creatures messing with water creatures, which for millions of years have, have been adapting to that environment. This is a, a dangerous portion of male activity. Um, so many, many times there was a shortage of men, even if uh, girls uh, were the victims of, of infanticide more often. What this did was balance out the numbers, um, at least to some degree. Um, however, they're, they're, the hunt would definitely cause a lot of shortage of, of men in that group. Um, material culture, again, uh, skins, clothing, housing, boat material. Skins would be used for all of these things, housing, boat material, uh, even eaten during times of famine. Um, so again, skins were probably the most important part of this, and we'll talk in, about clothing in a, in a second. 
um, vital to life. 